and immersive performances that reveal the hidden properties of objects, bodies and architectural sites. Drawing on his musical relationships, um, musical training, his social and familiar relationships often become the blueprint for multidisciplinary works that engage with intimate and universal concerns, such as the transmission of musical memories and personal and cultural meanings invested in the things we possess. For his resonance project 2007, vocal performances stimulate the natural harmonies of built structures, generating a disarmingly visceral relationship between the audience and interior space. By slicing and reassembling common objects to construct new mediums and forms, Beer's um, sculptural practice dissects the material world and the traces we leave on it. Oliver's work has been subject to many solo and groups exhibitions, notably at uh, Met Brower Metropolitan Museum of Art and MoMA PS1, New York, Centre Pompidou, Fondation Louis Vuitton, Palais de Tokyo and Chateau de Versailles, Paris, the Musée d'Art de Contemporain Lyon, Icon Gallery, Birmingham, Viles, Brussels, and the Sydney and Istanbul Biennales. Oliver has also held residences at the Palais de Tokyo, the Watermill Centre, Sydney Opera House, Fondation Hermes, and of course, Gallery Tadeus Ropak, where he was artist in residence during the building project here, while the building was being constructed. He's somebody, Oliver is somebody I've known for some time, and uh, hey, and here he is. Hi, how are Hi. you? Hi, I'm very well, how are you doing? Very good, and um, uh, you've got your earplugs in, or in whatever, as requested. Mine yeah. is, for some reason, unconnected. However, let's not deal with the technical details and get on to a wonderful conversation, which I know I'm going to enjoy hugely. So, if we start, you're sitting in your studio in Poland Street. I'm at Gallery Today as we're back in Dover Street, and it's always in a hurry to, to me how these wonderful things can connect in such, a, in such an efficient way. Mm. But I wanted to ask you about your upbringing, which you described <laughs> as extremely eccentric. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit about that and in what way. Sure. <laughs> Straight in at the deep end. Uh, oh, my upbringing. Oh. Um, well, I guess I did have a, uh, a kind of slightly uh, unique uh, environment to grow up in, uh, which was a, a house uh, in, the, in the countryside, an old farmhouse uh, that had been given to my grandma uh, by an old lady uh, who she looked after in the, in the 1930s for 20 years. And then uh, the house was given to my, to my grandma. Um, and uh, it was basically unchanged, I guess, since the end of the 19th century. There was, my grandma didn't do anything to it. My parents didn't do anything to it. Uh, it had no heating. It had no rules whatsoever. And if I wanted to paint the window panes all different opaque colors or uh, take down a door and cut it up and sculpt it into something new, there was no one to, to, to stop me or uh, discourage me. It was a very... Um, free environment and my family members were all sort of eccentric in their own ways uh, and my grandma was a kind of artist an amateur artist um, uh, who, who also probably saw uh, took a lot of joy in the strange things that I would do as a young child. It sounds amazing I had a very restricted um, childhood so this sounds to me I mean you, nothing could be more opposite to my own experience mm -hmm. but how did that freedom make you feel? And how did it influence you in make you into the artist you are today? For example, did you feel any fear growing up? And do you feel any fear now? And if so, of what? Weirdly, no, I, I never felt any fear. There was, I mean, there were no neighbors. There, was no, there were no limits. Um, weirdly, I was sort of untouched by the, by the outside cultural world for a long time. You know, I didn't have, um, a family who had direct access to museums and uh, concerts and things. And I think probably every time something hit me anew, it was very, very fresh. Like I remember I went on a school trip just to the Tate in about 1996 
and uh, I saw this photograph um, of a hand, and I'm sure you know it's the Donald Rodney in the house of my father. And I'd never seen a photograph as an artwork before, let alone an, a photograph that spoke so eloquently <laughs> to like such a, I, you know, it's the first artwork I remember thinking of as an artwork. And if you don't, if people don't know it, it's a picture of a hand laying on a bed. And in the middle of that hand is a, a shack, a tiny paper-like pinned together fragile structure. Um, and it's made from his uh, skin. I think he had sickle cell anemia and it was a skin graft, something to do with his treatment. Um, and I do remember actually even then thinking there was a kind of strange uh, parallel between the, the fragility, uh, obviously, of, of the body, his body in this case, uh, and of our architecture. You know, I was growing up in a place that was literally falling down around us. And, uh, and, and as, as, I've, as I've worked with architecture in the future as well, I don't know, I think being in that environment meant that when I met music and when I met art for the first time, it had all that much more powerful impact on me you know um, the first time I played piano properly was when a woman uh, came in off the street my sister invited her in and, and said um, this is Deborah she's running away from the bailiffs and she's all she's got left is her Steinway and she needs somewhere to hide it can she hide it in our barn uh, and that's how I started playing piano Deborah came with Basil her dog and uh, hid the Steinway in the, in the barn and, uh, and I had eight weeks of of playing piano with her and she taught me things that I should never as a beginner have learned but it was completely out of normal sort of normal codes of, uh, of music learning you know. It's, it sounds incredibly exciting and also as a child I think you know that ability to be open to things and also in fact turn them on the head and I've got a, a question for you about that a little later but you said um, music really is at the heart of what you do. Can you explain what you mean? I believe your mother, for example, is very musical. And there is an early video you made of her, um, I think, was it singing or playing an instrument? Singing. Singing and uh, playing. Singing. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were you encouraged? Did your, did your parents or your grandmother encourage you to be musical as a child? Did you sing in the choir? Or was it really a, a sort of, you know, your own initiative? Oddly enough, mum actually started making music probably around about the same time I did, and she joined the Women's Barbershop Chorus, uh, which is a fantastic structure and phenomenon. If ever you get to see 80 strong Women's Barbershop Choruses singing together, it's pretty, it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, impressive. And also culturally amazing, like they have costumes, they have choreography, uh, and she's been doing that ever since then, probably around about the same time as I, as I started learning music, because I guess when I say that music's at the heart of it all, it, yes, I, mean, I, was, I studied art, I studied cinema, but having thought about the world, I think ever since I was a kid, um, in a musical way, like, I, I, I always thought it was normal that you could walk into a room, an empty room or a staircase, and hear the, the key that the room was in. Um, and by that I mean that in the same way that a, like a, a wine glass or an organ pipe has got its geometry and that geometry determines the the note of, of, of the empty space. You know, an organ pipe is just an empty space that's resounding. If you walk into an empty stairwell in a car park and you listen really carefully, you can hear that your voice is not bouncing uh, arbitrarily off the walls in a neutral way. The, the room is sending back uh, its own resonant frequency is really strong. And if you, if you listen carefully and then if you sing them, uh, you can tease the music out of that architecture. Um, and I was doing this from a young age, like my first trip to London, I was doing it in the metro, in the, in the tube, uh, and confusing people. Because it sound, when you do this, you know, you sing the right note, your voice is completely disembodied uh, from you and the, and the space starts to sing. And, and I think as a sculptor, that sort of, I guess, natural way of thinking, I always just think of even, even you know, um, like an ultrasound scan or something. That's, it's, although it's a visual uh, it's a visual image. It's nonetheless, it's created by sound. And I think I probably, without really knowing it was odd, have always thought about the world in quite a, a, a harmonic, a musical, musical way. And how, when you say you talk about this trip um, to London, how, how old to this, this experience in the tube? How old are you? Oh, uh, like 11, 12. Really? Like that. You know, yeah. So incredibly sophisticated, even at that early age. So... I want you to move on to your extensive studies because you read fine art at Ruskin and we share, um, we share Richard Wentworth, although Richard was never my teacher in one formal sense, 
he had an exhibition at the Serpentine, so of course mm -hmm. he was my teacher through that experience. Yeah. And I think he was your tutor at Ruskin, and yeah. uh, he's, he's a very dear friend, I think, to us both. Um, and also he introduced me to Hans Ulrich, so there's a, mm -hmm. a little ode for Richard here. Yeah. Um, you studied composition at a very high level, and, um, and you also studied cinema at the Sorbonne. Uh, and at a very early stage, you were an artist in residence at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, and were given a show there by the very distinguished director, Jean de Loisy. Um, this is an extraordinary catapult for somebody who was a young artist at the time. What did it feel like in those early days when you were finding your feet? And did you have any uncertainty about where your feet would land? In other words, was there any doubt that you would be a visual artist or were you tempted to run to the world of cinema or architecture for that matter? Um, yeah, I don't think I, possibly because I, I grew up without any of these um, being encouraged in any direction. Um, I just kind of went in all of them at the same time. Uh, fully, um, I, I didn't really mind if I was going to be an artist or a composer or, or, or a film director because I, I, should, I, if I'm honest, I was probably a little bit precocious and didn't know that if I were to follow this path as an artist, it would be able to absorb so many of the things that I loved. And I was in a band at the time that was doing very well. Uh, and Great. Uh, and not, in, not in your CV. This is not in my CV, but it, you know, I left and they, they got signed to Sony. Uh, uh, so I feel like I helped them in that sense. But uh, the, uh, the, I think complete fluidity. In a way, this is like an, an inheritance from the 20th century, being an artist in the early 21st century. I never had to, I will never have to distinguish between the disciplines between painting, sculpture, filmmaking. And I studied music knowing full well that I was going to study art afterwards. And it was when I went to the Palais de Tokyo that I could see that uh, it was possible to do a master's degree for 250 euros a year in France at the time. And with a great um, tutor called Michel Chion, who's written some of the best uh, writing on sound in cinema. Nice. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely just never even now think about any division between, between a sculpture and a, and a composition or, or performance. You know, there's, uh, I don't see any need for it and it makes life much more exciting. No, there is no need for it and particularly now, but there was a time certainly when I was growing up, you know, if you were a painter, my lordy lord, if you went into film or sculpture, even for a second, this was considered to be a really a travesty and, and almost impossible to recover from. And of course, it is so healthy. That being said, filmmakers can become artists, poets can become sculptors. So it's a very fluid and I think exciting time. You've also said that architecture is at the heart of what you do because the building is a series of musical harmonies, as you've just described, about being in the tube and singing the, the sound mm. of the tube. You build rooms that can sing the note of that room. This is such an intriguing concept. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I mean, the, one of the ways to think of it is just that empty, every empty space is, it's not empty, it's full of air, and sound is just movement. Um, it's volume, it's space. Um, and it's a case of every empty volume having a note determined by its geometry. You know, you have a large wine glass with a large note, a small wine glass with a, with a high note. Um, and... If you uh, build a room that is, for example, 3.3 meters by 3.3 by 3.3, you have three sets of walls and the sound is bouncing back and forth at those wavelengths. And when we say wavelength, it's literally a length. You know, you can, you can visualize the air. It would be like a ball bouncing back and forth between those. But where, where is the end? Which, where, are the, where are the end points? Because oh. I think of sound as infinity. Well, so I guess in a, one of the easiest ways to think about this is, is kind of in a, in a contrary way to, you know, Cage's notion of silence as not silence. You know, there is, uh, even if you get completely silent into an anechoic chamber, you can still hear your blood and your nervous system. And the whole principle of 4 minutes 33, the idea of, a, of aleatory music playing out over time, is kind of the opposite of the way I see and hear silence insofar as if I walk into a, a small, narrow, tall room, I can hear, yes, there's aleatory, random sounds happening, bouncing around, but I can also hear that that silence has a particular color to it, like it has a particular key and it has a particular character. And you walk from that room to the next and you can hear the key change. And when the, I work a lot with singers and I, I've done a project called the Resonance Project for, for um, many years where every building, I mean, every, well, the fun thing is that every architect 
whenever they build a building, they are building a series of musical harmonies and they can't avoid it because every empty space is a musical harmony. And that's why I get on well so well with architects and with singers because I bring them into a space. I wish I could take you into the stairwell and sing to you well, here, but we know full well that that doesn't correspond, that we practice this. <laughs> we, we did. I mean, um, we, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I, I have to do my little piece about the stairwell experience. Yeah. Twice, in fact. But please, continue. Well, you know, story. it's simply that the, the phenomenon of this is so innate and so extraordinary that it's everywhere and it's, and it's in every architectural space. And if you even go back to Paleolithic caves and paintings in Lascaux and the Fond de Gome in, in South France, we know that the volumes of those caves have particular notes. It hasn't been studied at all. And it's something that I'm really, uh, well, it's been very little studied and I'm something I'm very deeply interested in. And if you, if I go into a space like that and I sing a particular note, the space will create a standing wave. Like, it's almost like your voice is the tip of the finger and the room becomes the wine glass. And you can't hear the tip of the finger, even though it's creating the sound, it's the wine glass that amplifies it. So when I took you into the staircase the other day and uh, tried to, to, to video what was happening, all you get on, a, on an iPhone, which is programmed to like diminish the sound when it gets too loud and to sit through the tiny speaker is, an, is this kind of very flat note, not very interesting. But when you're in a space with a human body and it happens, there's this kind of completely sublime moment where the sound from here is completely enveloped and eclipsed by the sound that comes from the room. And I no want one... to interrupt you only because sure. I'm, I, I'm the timekeeper and I'm all, always aware of how little time we have. And I want to talk about the first, when I first came to see, your, see you in your studio and you did the, the stairwell experiment, if I can put it like that, and an ordinary stairwell in, in a very nice, actually the studio was extremely nice, but I mean, it wasn't a distinguished architectural site, let's put it like that. And it was an extraordinary experience because it was really pure music. And the purity of that sound, of your voice in that context, which was, as I say, not distinguished, was so profound that I would defy anybody not to be profoundly moved by it. And it became a conduit to the human spirit in a way which was totally and uh, utterly surprising. And I want to, if, if I may, um, take us on to this amazing image, um, which was a piece that you did at the Sydney Biennale in 2018 two people singing into each other's mouths, competition, composition for mouths women, because it is a composition for mouths men. And how did you get to the point that you realized that this purity of sound and transmission of really a sublime experience could be trans, transferred in this way? Well, it's, that particular piece was a, a very happy accident and quite, uh, it's a, a a funny story that I'll tell as quickly as possible because we don't have much time, but basically I'd been asked to make a piece using the architecture of the Sydney Opera House and they had me in residence for on and off for a year. And I'd found an incredible cathedral-like tunnel under the Sydney Opera House, which yes, had I, I just the most amazing, uh, and you don't know this one because it's literally inaccessible and, and oh, no really? one's okay, you know, cut into the rock below sea level. And uh, I found it, just was tuning it. I knew exactly which notes it sang and I had four incredible singers from Sydney who were going to make an architectural performance with me. And just as I was in my final rehearsals, somebody climbed the uh, opera house to protest against uh, the treatment of migrants in offshore uh, detention camps in uh, Manus Island, which is a very, very good reason for them to be climbing and protesting. But the upshot was that basically the National Guard equivalent was sent in and the entire building was, was you know, swarmed with people and security. And they're like, who's this foreign guy four stories <laughs> under the building with these strange people pushing into the corners of the rooms and this strange sound that's coming out because they kicked me out. Uh, having been, I, I said, yeah, I've come an awfully long way. Would you mind if I kept going? Because it's my last opportunity. I've got to go back to London. And they're like, no. Uh, and I said, well, I knew it like the back of my hand, the building. So I went back into the fire escapes and I kept going uh, and I kept rehearsing. And of course they saw me on the cameras and they, they, the, rather than physically remove me, the compromise was to send one fireman per singer to survey us, uh, wow. which was fantastic for everybody. I was surrounded by um, beautiful Australian firemen for the rest of the day. They had the day at the opera. Um, the end of the day, they like, took my card and I couldn't even get back in at all. 
but what I was left with was in the lack of what I was meant to have, this beautiful building, this incredible building by Jornitz and that is a masterpiece, it sounded incredible. Suddenly it was gone and I had four bodies and no architecture. And I asked the singers, rather than waste our time together and to try and make the most of it, I said, look, what if you were to treat your bodies as the architectural space? Because each, just as the room has a cavity and a vessel has a cavity, our bodies have cavities as well. And I said, would you sing, I'm going to adapt the score, which was based on their earliest musical memories um, as children, and sing it through each other's faces. So if you lock clips with another singer, and no air can pass, like you're completely sealing each other's mouths. The only place for your voice to go is out through the other person's nose and vice versa. And where your two voices meet in the middle, there is like a third voice that's created. And it, I didn't know it was gonna be this extraordinary, but it, it, the friction, the harmonic friction of the interaction of those waves and those cavities, and they literally find the resonant frequency of each other's faces. Um, was it was very obviously it's quite acoustically amazing but what was interesting was that i'd asked the singers what was the earliest piece of music you've ever remember in your entire life and because i was in sydney um one one of the singers uh, tim his earliest me memory was an aboriginal melody taught to him by his aunts for which the language uh, is and the words are lost um because of the very awful history of uh, um, Aboriginal languages in Australia being lost. And it was the most extraordinarily um, beautiful descending melody, which didn't correspond to the Western scale whatsoever. You know, it has its own unique tonality. And that happened to be the earliest thing that he remembered. And that he was singing through the face of Clive, um, who's an emigre from London from the 1970s, a 65 year old bass singer. And his earliest musical memory was a Christian missionary song that his parents had taught him and I could never have chosen those tunes. But, but what would have happened if they chose, they'd chosen the Spice Girls or something? This that, is very... That, that would have been, that's the beauty of, of that question, is that you, don't, you can't choose what you remember. You know, yeah. you, you, and that, those Spice Girls would become part of the portrait and part of the um, fingerprint, the blueprint of that person and that music. But this, this particular piece that we've got showing here is like a kind of um, very simple, um, friction, it's a dissonance and a harmony at the same time. You, feel like you can't hear the words, uh, you can hear the melody. Um, and there's a, a kind of um, a, a very honest, there's something very honest about it because you, you ask those singers and they only have one answer usually. But it was lucky. I mean, you know, what beautiful examples they gave. Um, mm. Now I want to move on to the next picture, which is the image of Gallery Tadeus Ropak, uh, the opening show, uh, you, were, you were exhibiting here, you've been artist in residence. When I came to look around the building with Tadeus, you, uh, you were set up in the basement um, while the building was under renovation. And it, was, and it was the first time that I'd seen a piece of yours when the performers sang the building and made the most astonishingly beautiful sound. And the building itself, as you can see by this very grand staircase, is, is also very beautiful. It's the, an 18th century building, uh, the former London residence of the Bishop of Ely. And as you referenced before, this was part of your resi uh, resonance project, which I think began in 2007. So can you tell, can you talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, arguably it be began in the, in the tube in the 1990 something. Well, right? yeah. um, but this this project in, uh, at Ropank was a was a continuation of this principle where a singer, if they sing the right note, can instrumentalize the empty space of an, of an architectural um, structure. And so those people standing in the corners, uh, I taught them how to whisper the right note. And by whispering the, t the most pianissimo note you can imagine, the room will give them a really massive mezzo forte that comes back at specific notes that haven't changed ever since the day the building was made. And this is an interesting building because it was, I mean, um, the album of Club, it was, which was Oscar Wilde's club, uh, it was where the suffragettes started their movement. The building has had an awful lot of um, uh, extraordinary people come through it. Anyway, but during that time, the, uh, the architectural acoustics and the musicality of that architecture has stayed the same. Um, and uh, sorry, I've got messages popping up. Just give me a second, go away. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was a very natural thing for me to do as an extension of, of this project. And the beauty of it is that every 
um, building that I go into has a different tonality. It's a new instrument. And uh, every group of singers that I work with bring their own unique social and musical upbringing with them, you know? Yes. Now we move on to, if I'm not sure if you would quite describe it like this, one of the seminal pieces of your career to date, um, Vessel Orchestra, which was the extraordinary exhibition at Met Brower. Um, and um, you uh, had access to all the departments at the Met, some of whom didn't want to play with you, but many who did. And you borrowed a range of extraordinary objects, which you played in inverted commas, in the Met Bra for across the summer, I think of two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, as well as conducting or organizing a whole, um, a number of um, concerts with very distinguished people ranging from Philip Glass to uh, Laurie Anderson. Um, and so this was, do you feel this is your most ambitious project to, to date or is it really part of a trajectory of ambition after ambition? I don't know. It's not. It's not. It, it, I don't think of it in terms of ambition so much as just like sheer, like amazing catharsis of spending three years. It took me three years to individually seduce every conservator and curator on uh, at the Met to let me play with their pots, basically. Uh, and it, you know, there's um, a uh, to to explain just exactly how what's happening here. There, there's I was doing a project with Robert Wilson in Watermill in 2015, I think. And I was meant to do something architectural. The architecture wasn't playing ball. And I started playing with his vessels and his collection. And I remember he handed me this, uh, this uh, 5,000 year old Chinese vessel uh, and then told me how, how old it was. And I could hear that it had its own note, just like an architectural space did. And um, I discovered then that if you put a microphone inside, it amplifies the resonant frequency of that vessel. And you can actually create this, the process that I was working with in architecture on this very beautiful intimate scale. And there's some precedent for this with artists like Alvin Lussier, um, and it's a, like a scientific truth, you know. But what, was, what I was doing uh, that felt important was to organize the collection, Bob's collection first, uh, not through its aesthetic and historical quality, but, but for this very neutral and completely unbiased musical characteristic of are these objects in tune with each other? And by creating, I created the Tristan chord, which is F, B, D sharp, G sharp. Uh, the opening chord of Tristan and Isolde, which is a, a kind of controversial, it's like Manet's Olympia in art is the origin of, of um, you know, modernism. The Tristan chord is the mo origin of, uh, of modernism in music in many people's eyes. So anyway, these four objects from Bob's collection played that note. I showed that to Sheena Wagstaff from the, from the Met and she said very coyly, we've got quite a lot of pots. <laughs> uh, and I uh, blushed uh, and tried to work out what she meant. And three years later, I listened to hundreds of uh, vessels and chosen just the ones that correspond with the Western scale, with the well-tempered scale, and attached each of them to a microphone, which ran to a mixer, which ran to a keyboard, so that when you press down the key on the keyboard, it doesn't create any sound. It just turns on the microphone inside, you know, the Betty Woodman, uh, that sings a C or the Sot Sass penis vase that sings a B or uh, the 8,000 year old pre-Mesopotamian ceramic that sings the B below, you know? Um, and, and then it became an instrument and then I could invite musicians well-known and less well-known uh, to, I wrote a composition for it myself, of course, but also, um, as you said, some very respectable composers as well as bands like Mashru Leila, who are a phenomenal Lebanese band I, I've collaborated many times with, or Maternal Roberts. Roberts. Like, it, was, it was the most... I'm so happy we did it last summer because it was a completely yeah, joyous thing to bring this collection out of its um, boxes and, and vitrines and to, to level the playing field. You know, there was no uh, hierarchy between any of these makers. Um, we, and of course, the Met's history is tied up with all sorts of hierarchies and social uh, yeah, situations. It's fantastic, that, yeah. fantastic project. Now, I want to move on to the exhibition at Gallery Today's Road Back in London. Now, and this fantastic piece of yours, which I first saw in your exhibition at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham. Um, this exhibition is a very personal and moving homage to Oma. Oma is the German word for grandmother. It includes an extraordinary uh, pianola piece, which I'm going to take as an experiment, our viewers to go and have a look at in a minute. Music is at the heart of the exhibition, 
but also all the works in the show are about Omer's life. They're orchestrated into new compositions, they're objects that express their musicality, and um, the, it also has a most wonderful uh, series of works, and unfortunately we don't have time to go through them all, and I chose this, which I hope is um, indicative for you of, of some of them in the exhibition which I think is based on a Japanese painting. But the technique is very, very, very specific. So uh, you can see elements of musical instruments, but also perhaps it's very difficult to read what it is exactly and also how it's made. Mm. So these are, uh, I have to call them something, so I call them two-dimensional sculptures because they, they are completely two-dimensional, but they, they're made with the actual objects themselves. Um, I talked about an ultrasound earlier. If you think that sound travels in a straight line through materials, and that's how we have an image of a baby inside, it's a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional form. Years ago, I, I took my grandfather's tobacco pipe and sliced it in half down the middle, set it in resin so that you could only see the cut, sanded it so it was completely flush with the resin. So you end up with a single pictorial plane, but the most absolutely perfect diagrammatic representation of a pipe, which in, for many reasons is a great thing. It's Magritte, Cécile Pazine, Philippe. Uh, a peep in French is a blowjob. Uh, it's always phallic, it's always intellectual. And slicing it in half down the middle, setting it in resin and then crystallizing it in this way. It was like a very, it was, I guess it's almost like um, uh, uh, transforming a, an object into a drawing of itself. You know, it allows it to express its own forms. And then the piece that you're showing here um, is, is called Women Play Music on a Balcony because it's after an artist, a Japanese artist called Kitagawa Otomaro very beautiful painting. And uh, I've taken objects that belong to my grandmother, like her colored pencils, books from her shelves, um, her metronome, uh, which she never made any use of uh, because she was not allowed to study music. Uh, and I've sliced them up. I've set them into liquid resin uh, so that the cut is flush. And I've sanded it absolutely perfectly flush so that basically what looks like a painting is actually just a, the kind of very humble detritus of Omar's life. Uh, re-spelled out in, yeah, in space, as if you could kind of hear through the objects, instead of looking at them and your, your vision stopping at their surface, it's, it's a way of kind of perceiving the world acoustically. And it's become a really long and important body of work for me because suddenly every object has a hundred or a thousand different potential compositions within it, you know, you, depending on how you cut it, where you cut it, and, uh, and all that. And also how you put it together with whatever else, or whatever you do include, or whatever you don't include. Mm. But you describe this exhibition, Oma, as the most personal show you've ever made, and it's your way to deal with loss, and also who you are. What have you discovered about yourself, and who you are through the making of this exhibition? Um, you know, the show is, is just based on this moment when I was 15 and my Omar was 87. She wasn't allowed to study music by her father, uh, and so she'd never made music her whole life. And I, uh, she told me, Ollie, I've written a piece of music, uh, but I can't play it, obviously, and I, and I can't write it down. So can I sing it to you? And you can transcribe it to the piano and add harmony. Um, and I did, and she sang it to me again and again, saying, no, 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 yes, no, 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 no. Yes, and I got the harmonies of gradually in there as well. And then she said, I, I can hear more than that, I, and I want there to be more than that. She started drawing me pictures. She didn't know what a graphic score was, and I didn't know what a graphic score was, but she started drawing me pictures of what she thought the music would look like if she could write it. And it, was, it had a lot of pathos because it looked like music almost, but had no language behind it. And this show is about that moment. I, I still remember the music. She died in 2003. Um, and... I remembered every single note and I had them hand perforated into a pianola roll so that we can hear, I played it in obviously and then uh, turned it into this uh, automatic play, self-playing piano which is in the middle of the show um, and it has her writing, a combination of her writing and our conversations distilled into a text piece that runs through this pianola and basically just tells the story of how you know if she'd been able to study music, her father didn't let her uh, in the early 20th century she was born in 1913. Uh, you know, it was, uh, her male counterparts would have had infinitely more opportunities to express their mm. musicality and to pursue it. It was the only piece of music she ever wrote. She died two years later. Um, but you know, she, she, something very um, difficult about that moment of exchange, but also very precious because it's something that I have 
of her and now can be heard beyond the scope of her own life, which through social, social norms and necessity had been restricted to this very rural and isolated um, uh, context. But if I go back to the question, um, which I'm only repeating what you have said yourself, um, what did you discover about yourself and who you are through the making of this exhibition? I mean, obviously, your connection with your grandmother, which was so important mm. to you, has, has been and has been a profound influence and has become this many beautiful works of art, including the one I'm going to take everybody down the corridor, see the piano that you just described. Mm. But did it, it sounds as though it was an experience that was very profound to you. And although we're in the, this is the la my last question, mm. I think those occasions where, which are transformative, which it sounds as though this was, mm. you know, really the sort of humanity, there's a common, there's a commonness amongst us all. And whilst I realize I'm putting on you on, your, on the spot, I wondered if you could just say, if you could answer the question in a way that you set yourself, or the statement you, you made about this whole experience. You know, I, I, for this show, I had to look, I had to look very, very deeply uh, into my own history and it's my grandmother it's my omar and it's my loss uh, it's my inheritance you know and it's and it's precious and it's difficult and i had to wrestle her chest set out of my father's hands even though it was incomplete uh and so that i could then take it and slice it up and set it into the into the resin and and, and make it something more than just some forgotten memory you know after me these objects will be forgotten and passed on to charity shops and, and tips and, and like it, I guess what I discovered probably was that it, um, if I look really really deeply and kind of it's quite hard it's actually very hard to show everybody these, thing, these things there's a ring in there that she gave me <laughs> that I sliced in half because she had intended it for me to give to a woman one day and none of the guys I'm likely to use it give it to have got dainty enough fingers uh, to to wear it and rather than then, then let's leave it in a drawer. I've sliced it once laterally and once frontally, and it becomes this incredibly um, precious thing, um, sculpture. Um, and that's a hard thing to do. And, I, and by and by doing it, I've probably discovered that it's it's um, how do I put this? By looking inwards, in some ways, I think people have responded in a way that shows me it's my Omar, but it doesn't have to be her, you know. And you showed a kitchen floor briefly earlier. It's the earliest piece I still show is my Omar's kitchen floor. And she walked around on this linoleum for 40 years and gradually wore the pattern of her life into it. And after she died when I was 17, I rolled it up and I put it in the barn because uh, I didn't want anyone else to walk on it. And I'd, I'd walked around on it with her for 17 years as well. And her entire life was spelt out between these four walls. And it became, without me realizing it, it was before I was an artist in inverted commas, but uh, it's the earliest work I still show. And, it, and it's a key it's in a way to, to the architecture, but to also the, 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 the things that uh, inevitably we all collect, whether we're a museum and collect on the behalf of a, na a nation or an institution or an individual, we are in this very specific moment of flux and we are unique in where we are, what we can collect, what we can own. Ultimately, we'll cease to own it and someone else will, will, uh, will, 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 will take it on. So I don't know, it's a very difficult question what I discover about myself um, because every time I make a show, I'm discovering new things and uh, this one was particularly hard especially in the context this the context that we're working in now well I'm going to leave it there and take everybody with me when I go down the hall to to show them the extraordinary pianola and they will understand and I think be as moved as I was when I first saw it but dear Oliver thank you so much for being so generous with thank your you with your the history of your life and your the history of your family and how important they are and really congratulations on the show Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you for having me. No, thank you for coming. Thanks. Now, mask on, on we go. <laughs> and by the way, everybody, this is an experiment, so if it goes wrong, please bear with me. Now, the amazing thing about gallery today, it's Ropac, is that the, the gallery runs from Dover Street through to Barclay. So it's a kind of conceptual experience when you walk down the hallway because in effect, in effect you're walking through a block, um, which is amazing. And I'm going to do something.
a little bit ambitious here, which is to Now, I'm going to turn you around to me again, because I just want to go into the room. So I'm going to take a breath after that very moving piece which I've seen a number of times and I still find it as effective now as I did when I first saw it. You can now re-watch all the previous teas with me on our IGTV or our YouTube channel. Oliver's exhibition, OMA, a solo presentation of his work, is at our London Gallery together with a focus on painting featuring the work of Alvaro Barrington, Mandy El Sayeg, Rachel Jones and Donna Nelson, which I curated. Tony Cragg's exhibition, Inhabitants Sculpture, is on view in Paris at our gallery in the Marais, together with Robert Wilson's exhibition, Jean Création, which are both on show at our gallery in Pantin. On view in the Salzburg Gallery is Anselm Kiefer's exhibition, Per Vuelta von der Vogelwende, and online we are presenting Alex Katz's Soup to Nuts the Sao Paulo Biennale project. Next Saturday at 11 o'clock, I will be having tea with Gabriele Finaldi, director of the National Gallery in London, and I greatly look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you so much for joining me. Goodbye. <laughs>